There's the blinky light. Got a minute to go. I think we've hit the uh, start of the recording. Uh, so welcome to Th Southeast Linux Fest 2024. Uh, this talk is about NetBox for your network sanity. My name is Adam Kennedy, and I am a senior network engineer at TireRack. A little bit about me. Uh, I did a talk last year uh, here at Self uh, about TrueNAS. I started with Linux in about 1994, so something like 30 years ago. Uh, I feel extremely old. Looking at those dates, <laughs> I, am a, I was a senior sysadmin for an ISP and co-location facility for a number of years. Uh, I'm the, my official title is the Infrastructure Project Team Manager uh, at Tire Rack. I started in 2021, and I've been using NetBox uh, since about 2018, so a few years in there. For anybody that's curious, what is NetBox? So NetBox is what they call a source of truth. So if you've encountered anything like you know, a spreadsheet or something that you're keeping your, your uh, IP addresses and prefixes and subnets and things in, uh, that would be your source of truth for your IP addresses. Uh, but NetBox can actually handle that and so much more. Uh, they call it a data center infrastructure management or DCIM. Uh, that allows you to put devices in place in the rack in your DCIM so you know where that equipment physically is in the rack, uh, as well as which face of the rack that's mounted in, whether it's the front or the rear. Uh, you can keep track of your cables, your interfaces, power ports, all kinds of server definitions, whether they're physical or virtual. Uh, as I said, you can also keep it, use it as, to keep track of your IP address management, uh, and that will include IPs themselves, uh, the prefixes or subnets, uh, as well as AS numbers and uh, several other things. You can also use it for circuit management. Keep your circuit IDs, your contact information for the NOx, uh, the circuit info, how much bandwidth are, are you committed for on that circuit, where is that circuit terminate, where's the A and Z points you know, of that circuit, not just at a site level, but you can actually get all the way down to a port level uh, with that circuit termination. So what else is NetBox? Uh, well, since you can use it as a source of truth, uh, you can keep custom information about sites. So uh, at my work, we keep track of contacts for utilities. So having so many people in our uh, department, sometimes it's hard to keep track of, you know, okay, this site's without power, you know, who do you contact? What's the phone number? What's our account number? All of that stuff, just to get a simple status update of, hey, the power's out, when is it gonna come back? Um, there may even be something like an electrical contractor that something happens, you need to have somebody pull in some more fiber lines or more data lines or you need a new circuit you know, terminated for another equipment rack. Uh, we keep all of those contacts in here as well. Uh, special equipment required. So, of course, working in warehouses, you know, you occasionally you need scissor lifts, you need boom lifts, you need all sorts of uh, other things. And it comes down to, well, how tall does that scissor lift need to be? What's the width of your warehouse aisle so that you make sure that that scissor lift actually fits? Instead of trying to keep that information in you know, 12 different systems, we throw all of that into NetBox with custom fields, and it allows us to keep track of everything in one location without having to search around, and it has proved so useful for that. Uh, some things I didn't put up on this slide, uh, there are tons of plugins with NetBox that you can use it to tie into different things. Um, generally, because it is the source of truth, uh, you are supposed to put data into NetBox and then modify NetBox first and then let it sort of be the point. It is the master of the domain, the keeper of all the records. It is the source of truth. 
So you could use NetBox to drive other things, however. You could create a virtual machine in NetBox and have a script that actually feeds that into Proxmox or VMware or Azure or whatever, and it fires off the scripts that creates that virtual machine based on the data that you put into NetBox. So what are the different steps here? Well, maybe. It's not going to turn this insane mess into this beautiful work, <laughs> but you can document all the different pieces and parts regardless of which method it, or of which uh, cabinet it looks like. So the steps are, of course, you install NetBox, you've got it up and running. Um, step two is, of course, a question mark, and step three is profit. Well, what do you do in step two? There's a couple additional resources that can help you out with that step. We're going to go through a few things here today on how to take it from a clean installed position to something that you can actually you know, hopefully use. Uh, but there are all kinds of different resources. Uh, there's a course that the NetBox folks put together called NetBox Zero to Hero. It's extremely informative. It's a really good course. Uh, it does show a lot of the same material that I'm going to show today. It does get a little more in-depth on a couple of the other pieces, uh, as well as some other things you know, later on if you want to dive into you know, the real guts of NetBox and, and looking at plugins and a lot of other things that it can do. Um, things that I, you just can't squeeze into a 50-minute session. Uh, there's so much that NetBox can do. I, I could probably talk for a couple days and not touch you know, everything that, that you can get into with it. Uh, there is something called a device type library. We'll talk about that, uh, what device types are here in a, a moment. Uh, but there is a huge library of device types that the community has sort of submitted everything to. Um, if you get to a point where you decide that you have written a few device types and you'd like to submit those, absolutely feel free to push those in as a, a uh, push request. Uh, I do not work for NetBox. I, am, <laughs> I do have a different job, but I've been using it long enough. Um, I have seen everybody from all walks of life submit device type requests. So don't feel like, you know, I've only been using NetBox for three days. You know, I'm not, I don't have a right to upload something into the repo. By all means, if you've got the time and the ability to generate that file and you feel like you want to upload that and share that to the community, please do. The, the fact that this is so good and that device type library is so, so good, so large is because everybody is submitting their work. And of course, NetBox Cloud, which we're going to use today uh, for our demonstration. They just rolled out. Uh, there's some information. There's, there's pamphlets up here or handouts up here that talk about the NetBox Cloud and the different tiers. Uh, so you don't have to install it on-prem if you don't want to or, or run it you know, on a VM someplace. If you just want to dive in, start using it, and play around with it, they do have a free tier. Uh, that's what I use. And I also have a, an on-prem instance that I have at my house and, and at work. Uh, but you can have a commercially supported version of it if you'd like. So you get everything installed, and you're left standing in an open field. It is completely blank. And a lot of times when I'm staring at something completely blank, that's exactly what my mind is too. There's nothing to go by. You're just stuck there going, what, what do I do next? Well, let's talk about what you do next. So there's a couple of building blocks that I like to go through, whether I'm setting up an instance for my house or another instance for a development environment or our production environment uh, at Tire Rack. First, I like to start with geographical objects. So we start with regions, locations, and sites. It's an easy thing to start with. You know what region your stuff is in, and this can be self-defined. Our regions are defined by what US state we have our equipment, our uh, sites in. But if you'd like to start with something more specific, if you want to say North Carolina, South Carolina, or you can go with Charlotte, you can go with some other city that's in North Carolina. You can get very broad, very specific. It's completely up to you what you want to make the regions, as well as the sites and locations. The device manufacturers, types, and module types are something that you would want to build into uh, your, your system as well. Uh, you can import those from that device type library, and I'll show you a, a couple examples of that. You want to start with your power sources as well. So defining a circuit panel. Uh, of course, for my house, I only have one circuit panel, but in some place like a corporation, you're going to have multiple circuit panels. Hopefully those are labeled. Uh, <laughs> if they are not, 
uh, just coming up with labels generally, you know, panel one, panel two, east panel, west panel, whatever makes sense in your environment. Uh, but it, having them named does help significantly. Uh, if they're not named currently, I have found my past self helping out future self a lot of times where I'll actually name the label or uh, name the panel and then someone says, hey, where's that circuit breaker? It's like, well, it's the left panel if you're looking at the panel or, you know, whatever. Instead of trying to do that, you put a nice label on the panel. Well, it's in panel one. It's circuit 20. That makes it crystal clear. IP prefixes and subnets and VLANs are, are something that we'll also talk about, uh, but those are something you want to kind of get prepared, whether that's pulling a list out of a switch someplace or if you have a, a Unify controller or something you can pull that list from. Uh, but having that list ahead of time and just pumping through them all, getting them all populated is, is a, a good idea. Uh, as well as prefixes and subnets, whether it's just a simple you know, show IP route and you parse through that with something, uh, or just taking a look at everything that you've got in this current spreadsheet and just trying to, to chunk through them all. There are import routines in NetBox. I'll show you what those look like. Uh, that's what we did when we first initially brought everything into uh, NetBox. We were using a different tool. We were able to export that data, kind of clear it up as a CSV, and then just do a massive import into NetBox, and it made life so much easier. Racks and rack rolls. Uh, so you, you kind of think, it, you hear rack rolls. When I first started pumping data into NetBox, I thought, what, what is a rack roll? Like, why, why would my rack have a different role? Its role is to hold stuff. Like, what it... What role would I give it? Uh, and then I started thinking about it, and usually in a corporate environment, we have an MDF and an IDF. And so for those not familiar, your MDF is your master distribution framework. So that's going to have, you know, basically your network core. It has all the core switches, servers, you know, whatever else you might have. And then your IDF, or your uh, intermediate distribution framework, uh, has maybe switches that are in an access layer or a switch, uh, a cabinet that's usually much smaller but maybe further away from the MDF. You know, it's in a corner someplace or a closet or hanging from the roof. Uh, we've got usually anywhere between one and, you know, 15 IDFs depending on a, a warehouse. Your providers, provider accounts, provider networks, circuit IDs, that kind of stuff, uh, that's all also something good to have up front when you're starting to put this data in. Um, again, not required to put that data in here. There are very few required fields in that box, but the more data that you can give it, the more useful of a tool that becomes. So providers are always something that's really difficult to deal with sometimes. I used to work in an ISP. I know how difficult they can be. Uh, so trying to get all of your contacts and everything ahead of time might take a little bit of work, uh, but definitely worthwhile to find out. Circuit types and circuits uh, are something else I, I put in. Devices and modules, I must have apparently forgot that was there when I <laughs> wrote the top one. Uh, VMware clusters, or not VMware, but virtual machine clusters and VMs. Um, again, we, we keep lists of that in here as well, but getting your own lists and exporting that entire list out and then import it as a CSV or, or hand type it if you are really that bored um, is, is helpful. So that's the end of the slides. Everything else we're going to do is basically live in the NetBox instance. So hopefully the internet cooperates and the universe doesn't decide to make a big joke. Um, let me maximize this here. Hopefully everybody can see that. That font is crazy small. A little, bit, a little bit easier to get to. So here's the device type library. So this is off the NetBox community uh, GitHub. When you first browse in, there's so many different repositories that you can look at. Uh, but this device type library is, is kind of the, the awesome one. Uh, I mean, they're all awesome, but this is the one I use the most. So this has device types. Uh, there's what they call elevation images. So that's what the equipment actually looks like. If you're looking at the front of a picture of a rack, the elevation image is the, the picture that it's going to put in place in the, the fake rack that's in NetBox. Uh, but that's what you'll see front and back uh, are those elevation images. There are module types. So an example of a module might be, let's say you have a, um, a Cisco router that can take different modules or an HP switch that can take different modules in the switch. Uh, the 5406 switch comes to mind, uh, the Aruba 
5406. So it has six bays that you can put different modules into, and that's what these modules are, is the, the switch itself will just be empty bays when you put it into NetBox. And as you insert those modules into the bays in NetBox, it will create the interfaces depending on what module type you're installing uh, in that switch. So there are different things in here. When you go into device types, there's all kinds of brands. Um, <laughs> there are so many. But dumping into something like Cisco, for example, here are all the different models of equipment that they have. There's access points, there's switches, there's routers, there's all kinds of different things. You don't have to import these one by one. There is a script uh, or it's more of a project out there that has an import routine. So you can use an import script that you upload to uh, your NetBox installation and tell it what brand of equipment you want to import. And it will just import everything for that brand into your NetBox instance. Uh, if you just want to import absolutely everything for a brand, that's the easiest and fastest way to do it is that import script. Um, I get a little picky. My OCPD won't allow me to have thousands of unused objects <laughs> in that box. Uh, so I end up doing everything one by one just because I want it to be nice, neat, and clean. Uh, so I do it one at a time. Module images uh, are, are really kind of neat. Um, just helps to see what a module looks like sometimes. Uh, module types are just like device types. Again, it's kind of sorted by brand, uh, but you drop into like Cisco, for example, and these are the different modules that you can install into a router or switch. A few other things in here. Uh, there, there are some scripts, just some example scripts, and, and some of them are, are pretty useful. Um, there's tons of other objects out there. If you just look for NetBox scripts on, just Google it. I mean, there's tens of dozens of scripts that people have written to do different things uh, in NetBox. So that's the device type library. Uh, let's dive into NetBox itself. I did basically more or less start with a clean slate here. Um, I, let's see if that font, a little bit bigger. Does everybody see that okay? Is it kind of visible mostly? We, we can go up another size or two here. I look all right. Well. Go with the font too big and the menu goes away. A little bit better, hopefully. OK. I think it's about as large as I can get that font without getting too crazy. Um, so like I said, starting with um, the organization stuff, looking at regions, I did pre-populate North Carolina in here. So I just called it NC. It's a nice abbreviation. You can add, just by clicking Add, typing in the region name, you can make sub-regions. So if you have NC as a region, Charlotte could be a child of that. So we could just pick NC as the parent, type in Charlotte. If I could spell. Oops. Hit Create. And now we have another region. So you can see here the region doesn't have any sites, locations, or racks tied to it quite yet. Um, but the region is there. You can click any of these little links here to go back to different sections. There are several different places to click into things in that box. So you don't have to keep going all the way back to the beginning and clicking all the way through. There's tons of different ways to get to the data. Uh, so if you find yourself looking around trying to get back to like, how, how do I get back to that spot? Just look around on the page a little bit. There's probably another link to, to browse. So we've got our regions. Let's look at sites. And I did pre-populate here for self 2024. It's already in the NC region. We're just going to edit this site so you can see some information here. But we gave it a name. Uh, you can define if a site is active, planned, or decommissioning, or retired, uh, which is really helpful because if you're working on decommissioning a site or if you're planning on deploying a new site, you can put it into that status and then people know what's going on with that site. You don't have to worry about, oh, I don't want people putting equipment in here yet. It's not quite ready. Mark it as planned or staging or whatever. So if we say staging, you can see the, it changes colors and stuff on the page. We're going to change this to be the Charlotte region. You can assign facility information, ASN numbers. Uh, if it's in it, you can tell what time zone it's in, uh, a few other different things. This is multi-tenant. So if you have an organization that has multiple 
you know, sub organizations or, or uh, divisions even, you can give each division their own tenant in NetBox. And if you want to get crazy with permissions, you can actually allow uh, the permissions in NetBox so that certain people that log in only have access to their tenant and that's it. Uh, we do that for, for a couple of teams uh, that need access to data. They don't necessarily need to touch everything in the entire system, uh, but they do need access to their own gear. So that's, that's kind of nice that that feature's there. Pop in a physical address or a shipping address as well as GPS coordinates, maybe some comments if you want to get a little bit of a hint on how to find the building or something of that nature. Hit save, and now we've got our site. So here you can see the status is now staging. Uh, that was a nice green active previously, uh, but it, just an easy way to, to find that info. So now we've got our site and our region. Um, we can add locations to this if we want. So you can click on here and go to organization and locations if you want to. Um, I think that's a little more difficult because you have to select what site that location is part of. I like to be lazy and click on the site itself and then click on locations inside the site. And then every location that I add um, by default becomes part of that site. So I can click add, oh, you jerk, of course. Turn me into a liar, why not? It's live. Um, so we can give this a, a name, say Ballroom A. It is active, hit create. So now any racks or devices that I add into Ballroom A will show up in this location. They'll still be a member of the site and, they'll, and you can access everything and search for everything as if it were a member of the site, but it's part of this location specifically within the site. So this room does not have a rack, but we do have a device. We've got a switch down here. We've got an access. Uh, this room doesn't have an access point. Some of the other uh, ballrooms have an access point, uh, but we do have a switch in the ballroom. And let's say we wanted to document what ports were here on the switch. Well, we can't quite do that yet, because if we go to devices and we want to add a device, you can see down here at the bottom, there's, there's no device roles. There's no device types. We haven't loaded any of that data in here yet. So that's why kind of creating everything ahead of time and getting you know, the framework ready is sort of important before you start populating uh, everything. So it's telling us when I create a device role. Let's go ahead and do that. We're going to click Add. And the device role, we're just going to call it Switch. You can assign every uh, device role a color. So that's a, I don't know what brand of Switch that is, but we're going to make it orange, amber. Whatever. It is not a virtual machine role. You can assign these a config template. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but we'll create that device role. So switch is created. Let's go back to device roles and add a couple of more. So let's click add. We're going to say uh, might have a device that's a power device, like a UPS or something of that nature. Let's add another one. We'll call this router. Also not a virtual machine. So you can either click create or create and add other. Pretty much everything in the box has this create and add other button. Um, it just makes it really easy if you're going to add multiple things at once to, to kind of pump through it. Some of the fields it will keep as defaults. So if you're adding like lots of interfaces, for example, it'll kind of keep track of the interface types and everything as you're adding them. Uh, just to help out a little bit with less typing. Uh, we'll say firewalls in here as well. And create and add other. We're going to add one more and call it a server. Oh, we're going to do one more and call it a VM. And this one will be a VM role. Okay. So we have our device roles. We still can't quite create devices yet. We need to import some device types. So what I did ahead of time was I went through the device library and just picked out a, a few things. Um, stuff that I use at home that I think we're kind of using here uh, at the conference as well. So we've got a few, few things here. These are all YAML files. So everything that you download from that device type library is going to be a YAML file. These are real simple. To, to pick out. 
Um, I did not clear out my other tabs on this, so hopefully nothing <laughs> terribly uh, exposing is, is showing up here. Um, but we can take a look at what these files look like. So it's real basic, real simple. If you've seen a YAML file before, you've, you've seen a thousand of them. Uh, so here we have just manufacturer, what model of device that is, part numbers, how high of a, you know how many rack units does that device take up, um, all sorts of other information in here, console ports, interfaces. So it's it's very very boring when you look at it, um, but it is important to have this available when you import them. So the device types that I'm going to import, there's a couple here. I'll go back to my browser. I'm going to unminimize just for the sake of being able to easily drag and drop. Um, but let's go to devices and down here to device types. And I'm going to tell it to import. Now we've got to create a manufacturer first. It's good that it has these little tips because you forget when you only set it up a couple of times. So manufacturer will say Cisco is a manufacturer. Hit create. Take a real quick look. What are the other things? Dell and Unify. Come back to manufacturer and there. I think that covers everything we're going to import. Back to device types. We're going to import. So you can copy paste the data or you can upload a, a file. Uh, there's a few other ways you can assign it to data files. Uh, like you can actually have it watch a location on the actual hard drive of your virtual machine. So if you just want to dump a bunch of stuff in through Samba or if you want to have it pull a Git repository every day or something like that, um, it can watch that location and just import things uh, from there if you want. We're going to upload the files here. So we're going to start with this Cisco switch. Come on, drag the file. No, not rename it. Oh, fine. We'll do it this way. Got to love doing things live, right? Okay. So now it's imported this device type. So we can see here it's a Catalyst 9300 switch. There's the part number, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, when we click on this device type, you can see the different aspects of the switch uh, that it has done. So there are six module bays in the switch. There's fans that you can install. There's a network module slot. There's power supply slots in the back. And under the position column, uh, some of these have, like this network module has a one uh, power supply A says A, power supply B says B. So what's really awesome about this is when, if you're familiar with Cisco gear at all, uh, usually it has the module number, uh, or I'm sorry, the, I can't remember what, it, what it's, what the first name actually is, but it's, it's something like, you know, gig 101 or 111, one slash one slash one or, uh, you know, two slash one slash one for the, the actual numbers on the interfaces. So those are slots, subslot, and interface number. And that's what this is actually defining. This position, when you insert a module into that network module here in NetBox, it will create interfaces based on what that module is. So the, the other interfaces here are called, you know, uh, gig ethernet 101. So if I install another module, the other modules it's going to create, instead of zero in the middle here, it's going to say one slash one slash one, one slash one slash two, and so on to however many interfaces are in that module that you've installed. But you can see there, there's all sorts of other information that you can capture as part of these modules, or as part of these interfaces. So we know gig 101 is enabled by default. It is not a management only. It's a one gigabit uh, interface. The PoE mode is PSE, so it's a power supplying equipment. It supplies PoE power. And here's the PoE type that it supplies. It does not have a wireless role, uh, but you can edit this, change it, whatever. 
One important thing to keep in mind when you're adding or editing device types is that when you add a device type or modify a device type, it does not change anything about devices that have already used this device type. So it's more of a template. When you create a device and you tell it it's a Catalyst 9300 switch, it's just going to create that device. It's not going to tie it back to this template. So if I change this template later on, the devices I've already created will not change with it. You have to additionally modify those devices you already created. Now there are scripts that will make that a lot easier that you can tell it, okay, make this device match the device type and it can do some magic behind the scenes. Uh, but just keep that in mind if you're wanting to add interface types or something of that nature later on, uh, the things you've already created will not cascade through. Yeah, I'm going to import a couple more device types here. See if I can get the drag and drop to work correctly. Just want to get, oh, doggone it. There's a bar here on the, on the podium. It kind of makes dragging a little difficult. All right, so we're going to import that one. And yeah, we'll go back. Import. Module so you can see what that, oh my gosh. There we go. I'm not sure, oh, because that's a module, not a device. <laughs> Wrong place to import. All right, I think that's good enough. So let's import some modules real quick as well. There's really only one that I want to import. There. Okay. So we've got some device types. We've got some device uh, modules ready to go. I think we're good to start actually popping stuff into a rack. So let's go back to organization. We're going to go to sites. We're going to go down here to self. And again, this is just general information about the self conference. We're going to click on racks. And we're going to add a rack. So this rack is going to be part of self 2024. Uh, we don't have a location because the rack's not here in the ballroom, uh, but we're just going to leave that location blank for now. And this, we're just going to call it the main rack. It is active, rack roll. We don't have one assigned, but you could assign this to you know MDF, IDF, or whatever naming you want to, to give it. Description, if there is a specific description you want to assign, you can. Um, there's another thing in Netbox called tags that... I don't want to get too far into, but it's just another way to identify different equipment. Uh, so if you want to give it a tag of something like, maybe it's a rack that a carrier actually owns, or it's a tag you want to assign a tag that um, maybe something is under a specific jurisdiction of a you know certain team or something like that. But everybody kind of puts gear in there. Uh, you can maybe assign it a different tag like that. Uh, your imagination can run wild with what you can track with with tags. Uh, we don't have a facility ID for that. There's no serial number or asset tag for the rack. We are going to say that it's a four-post cabinet. It is 19 inches wide. The starting unit at the bottom, usually, is one. It is 42U high. I do not have dimensions of how big the rack is on the outside or anything, but we can guess a little bit. Um, ah, we'll just skip that for time. But you can put that information in there. Weight is also a very important thing to track when you're adding equipment to a rack. Um, you know, in case your floor is a raised floor and it doesn't carry that much weight. Um, you want to keep track of it. Mounting depth, I've also found, is extremely important. Uh, if you buy a 36-inch deep server and you have a 24-inch deep rack, you're going to have a bad time. Ask me how I know. So there's no other comments or anything we want to add here. We're just going to create the rack. 
So now if we scroll down here, uh, we can see our space utilization is currently zero because we haven't put anything in it yet. We can see specifics about the rack. You can attach an image of the rack if you like. I'm going to do that real quick. Browse back here to my spot. So this is a picture of my rack at home. Rack front. I am that guy. Whoa. Too large. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> good to know. Content is too big. We'll, uh, we'll skip that for now. Um, so scrolling down a little bit further here, you can see this is what they call the rack elevation. So once we start populating this, uh, these individual rack units will start showing pictures of the gear if we import a picture of the gear. Without a picture of the gear, it just shows the name that you assign that piece of equipment. Um, so again, kind of pressed for time slightly. We're going to ignore what the pictures look like. Uh, but we're going to add a device here into rack unit 20. We're going to give this device a name. We're just going to call this the main switch. Device roll. We did this earlier. We're going to switch. The device type, this is why it's required, is the Catalyst 9300. You can keep track of airflow if you would like. It is front to rear, what the serial number and asset tags are. Um, if there's a specific lat and long for some reason, if it's not in the building, and statuses and all that kind of stuff. Uh, platform is kind of nice if you want to, I find this mostly useful for tracking, like if you have firewall brands that could have two different image types on the firewall, like Cisco, for whatever reason, thinks their firepower needs to have like three different operating systems available. Um, you can track what platform is installed on that firewall or Servers is another very useful one that we use quite a bit. Uh, when you're installing a virtual machine, okay, DNS could be anything. It could be Linux, it could be Windows, it could be BSD. Being able to put that platform in here and select that also gives you another way to automate because you can fire off Ansible scripts and use NetBox as an inventory and tell it to uh, start running scripts against all Linux servers or all Debian Linux servers or whatever you select in the platform box and just let it rock and roll on all of that stuff. Oh, it's amazing. The cluster, we do not have a cluster created yet, but we'll do that here in a moment. Um, everything else looks good. So we're just going to click Create down here at the bottom. So now we have our main switch. And here's what I'm talking about with the extra links. So I, want it, I would like to go back to the main rack and add another device in there, but I don't want to click the back button. I don't want to roll through the menus again. I can just click main rack right here in the device page, and it'll take me to that main rack again. So if we scroll down, now we will see in this elevation, there's our main switch. We know it is in rack unit 20, no questions asked. Let's add another switch below it. We'll call this second switch. We'll just roll through these pretty quick. Catalyst. Yep, all looks good. No other info. Create. So now if we scroll down, now we have two switches. So let's go into main switch, and let's say we do have an uplink module that we've installed into this switch. So looking at the interfaces, we have 48 ports here. Uh, it only goes down to 1048. Then we've got some stacking ports in the back. Uh, but we have a network module we've installed. It's a 10 gig network module, so we can have some nice uplinks and uh, plug that into a, another switch. So to do that, we're going to go here to these module bays. And we're going to scroll down to this network module. And I'm going to cl click this green plus button. So this is going to let us install a module uh, into this switch. So now it's asking us the module type. So we're going to pick the CS9300 NM8. Yes, sir. Uh, is it possible to have NetBox be pulled from a for, pulled from using SNMP from a switch? Not natively, but there are a couple scripts that you can uh, have it pull that data and then import that into NetBox, but it's not a native function of NetBox itself. Do 
depends on the script. <laughs> I say that because I tried doing that with our virtual machines. Uh, trying to import you know, 400 virtual machines is a long process. Um, our environment is nowhere near as large as some other organizations, so I feel for these folks that have you know, tens of thousands of VMs that they want to document. Um, but importing 400 was enough of a labor-intensive task that I wanted to script it. The scripts that were available that would go out, fetch all the information about the VMs, and then pop it into NetBox, there were some liberties taken with the script writers of what they thought should be documented into NetBox that did not match the way we wanted to document things in NetBox. And a lot of data had to be manipulated afterwards. Uh, but that being said, it was a lot easier to manipulate the data at scale than it was to try to hand type or try to script everything in you know, ourselves. Uh, so yeah, just depends on, depends on the script. The Nmap ones to go out and find what IPs are active and check like DNS names and stuff like that. Those are pretty solid usually, uh, but yeah, active equipment, it, it depends. So there's a button here or a checkbox here that says replicate components. Uh, this is where it will create those interfaces when I click create here at the bottom. If you've already created a couple of those interfaces uh, and you want it to not duplicate those, you can tell it to adopt the components. So the, the thing about it adopting is that it has to be named exactly how it would have automatically populated in order for that to match. If you've got it named 10 gig one and it's expecting it to say 10 gigabit ethernet one, it's not gonna match. It does 100% have to be the same kind of naming scheme uh, for that to adopt it. We don't have existing, so I'm not gonna check the box. But we'll go down here and hit create. And now you can see the interfaces have more options. If we go all the way to the bottom, page three now has 10 gigabit ethernet ports that weren't there before. So let's just see, what does it look like to actually connect two switches together? First, let's go back to our device. We're gonna go back to the main rack and we're gonna click on second switch and do the same thing we just did. We're gonna add a module to it. And let's say we just wanna connect these two switches together. Um, so let's go to interfaces. Let's pick the highest 10 gig port here. And if I scroll kind of over to the right a little bit, you can see the port type is SFP plus. So it's a 10 gig interface. Uh, there's a couple of buttons over here to the right. So this blue button allows you to, to add sub interfaces, IP addresses, uh, inventory items like SFPs, things like that. Um, you can add an IP address. We'll do that here momentarily. Uh, but this green is to connect a cable. So you can connect cables to interfaces, front ports or rear ports, or if it's a circuit termination, you can add that circuit termination right here to the interface. So we're just gonna connect these two switches together. We're gonna click interface. And it asks you, great, what's the second switch or what's the second device you're gonna connect? So we're gonna choose, wait, which one was I in? Second unit switch. We're gonna pick main switch and the interface. You can just start typing here, 10. There's 10 gigabit. We're gonna pick the highest one. It asks what kind of cable. There are so many different things in here. When you start populating data, it's like, I didn't even know half these things existed. Um, so you can use DAT cables if you want to. Uh, there are different fiber types. So we'll just pick fiber OM3. That's usually aqua. Again, with color, you just start typing the name and it will come up. So it's an aqua. We'll say it's a one meter cable because it's short enough without being too short. Hit create. And now when we look at this interface, all the way on page three, the color has changed in the row and we can see that this is now cable number one. It's connected to the main switch. It's connected to the 10 gigabit 118 interface on the main switch. 
And there's a pretty trace button here that's now illuminated. So what's so amazing about this trace button, I love this thing. It's one of my favorite features in that box. Uh, you get into situations in a corporate environment where a switch at the MDF has a short patch cable that goes from the switch to a fiber patch panel, the back, on the front side of a fiber patch panel. The back side of that patch panel goes 200 and some odd trillion inches or whatever out the other side to another cabinet that plugs into the back of another fiber patch panel. From the front of that one, it goes into another panel because somebody decided that that wasn't where it actually needed to be. The back side of that second panel goes another 200 feet to someplace else to another patch panel that connects into something else that connects into something else that finally plugs into the switch. How do you know where all of that junk is and what's along the way? Because when you're documenting this in Visio, it just shows those two switches are connected together, right? You don't see all of the other garbage that's in the middle that could be causing a connection problem along the way. With Netbox, you can document absolutely every patch panel, every port, everything in between, and when you click Cable Trace, it will show you all of the pieces in between, all of the cables, if you've put in how long those cables are, it will tell you what the total length is of the run at the bottom. It adds everything together. So it's, it's pretty slick. You can see all the port namings and all that in between uh, along the way, and that way you can go check stuff. You can see what building it's in. You can see what rack it's in. You can click on the specific devices. So if main switch was here, I can click on main switch, and it takes me to that switch. If I click on the interface instead, it takes me to that interface. So if I want to see what kind of interface is it, did somebody add notes in here or a comment of like, hey, this port blew up five months ago, but we haven't replaced it yet. Somebody needs to touch it. You can add those comments in here, and somebody can take a look. What's also pretty cool about Netbox is this change log. So the change log keeps track of absolutely every change that I'm making and tells you who made the change. So if there's any questions about, hey, somebody changed this cable in Netbox, you know, what happened? Wasn't this plugged into this other device last week? You can see what happened to that device. You can see what happened to that cable. There's also a helpful journal. So this is where you can add your own manual entries uh, to things that, that happen. So if I want to say, hey, um, might have happened that somebody took a sledgehammer to the switch. Interface had percussive maintenance. <laughs> I can hit save. And now, when someone goes to find out why is this interface not connecting on this switch, it should be, oh, OK, somebody whacked it with a hammer. Got it. And I can see, oh, it's supposed to tell you who created that. Oh, it does right there. We'll go back to interface, go back to main switch. You could do the same thing with console ports, power ports, all sorts of stuff. So here in the module bays, I didn't load the, the, mo the power supplies, but if I add a power supply uh, to this, it will show up with a power supply on the switch. But let's say, for example, you don't have that. Let's say you're creating all of these objects by yourself. The switch that you want to add doesn't exist in the device types. You want to add something new. Not a problem. Let's go to devices, device types, and let's just add a new one. Manufacture, we'll say ubiquity, model, US 20, USW 24, man, I can't type. It's one U high, it's not really full depth, I don't remember the part number, it is front to rear, I don't know, it weighs five pounds, I don't have images, create. So you can see here, this does not have interfaces like the Cisco one did. It doesn't have power ports, it doesn't have anything. It's another blank slate. But you can add the components under this Add Components menu. So you can choose, I wanna add a bunch of interfaces. So let's click Interfaces. Here's the name. Immediately, my anxiety would start ringing through. I'm like, oh God, there's like 48 interfaces on this switch. I don't want to have to do this 48 times. There's got to be an easier way. There is. 
you can do shortcuts on these. So if you want to say this is port 1, you could go 1 through 24, or as described just under this name, you can see it says alphanumeric ranges are supported for bulk creation. Mixed cases and types of, uh, within a single range are not supported for, for that though. So we can say port, open square bracket, 1 through 48, close bracket, it will do exactly that. It'll create ports 1 through port 48 automatically, no problem. Now those all do have to be the same type. So if you are creating, you know, 48 gig Ethernet ports and you want to go back through and create, you know, another 10 SFP ports, you can just keep in mind that when you're adding these, they, the ones you're adding in that range will all be created as the same type. So here's where we choose that type. Uh, this could be a virtual, like a VLAN interface. Uh, you can make it a lag or you can pick something specific. So there are more interface types than, like I said, I knew existed. Uh, there's tons, all kinds of junk, even up to the, the big eight new OSPF standard of 800 gig. Um, it's, it's all in here. So we're just going to pick these as standard one gig interfaces. They are enabled. They are not management only. PoE mode, we'll say that this is a PoE switch. You can push 8023AT. 